pleasure to listen to Professor Kazimir Andrzejewski. All of you probably know him. He's working since many years on ultra cold gases. He was awarded a, a lot of different prestigious prizes, including so called Polish Nobel Prize, which is the award of the uh, Foundation for, for Polish Science. He also received the Nobel Prize, the same achievement. And since many years, he's working on statistics of ultra cold gases. And the topic of this uh, colloquium mm -hmm. is also uh, related to statistics of ultra cold bodies. So, Professor, Okay, thank you, Christoph. I understand that I am some kind of a last minute replacement of somebody who should give the talk today. I said, okay, I will try. Uh, I spoke about this issue that I'm going to cover today almost exactly two years ago here. Since then, there is a progress. We have done some new work. Uh, that will be reported today, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately, there will be serious overlap between what I'm going to tell you today with what I was telling at this at exactly the same place two years ago. Uh, I will try to avoid too much repetition, but of course, there's also part of the audience that never heard about these things that I'm going to cover. Uh, so some very, very clear uh, elementary introduction uh, is a must for such a talk. All right. <laughs> so first of all, the subject matter that I'm going to discuss here, for me, is really the old, truly old one. And it's truly exactly a quarter of a century since I started looking at the fluctuations of both Einstein columns. Uh, that, for me, has started in 1997, uh, and of course I was coming and living, coming and living over the years. I, I had a lot of very able, very capable, very smart uh, colleagues contributing to this work. I've listed the names here, but they are in two columns. The column on the right are these new papers and new results that were obtained with, with this group of people with Krzysiek, as you see, marked specially as, as a senior member. The last to join is Piotr Kulik, who is here, who is still an undergraduate student in, in the physics department of the university. The reason why over the last couple of years we returned to this issue of fluctuations is something that I've already mentioned here uh, last time, namely this great achievement of our colleague Jan Alt and his wonder team in Orhus in Denmark, who were the first to measure the fluctuations of a condensate. For many years, for many years, really, this question of fluctuations was a truly <coughs> academic issue was a theoretical issue, uh, <laughs> attracting attention of theoreticians, of course, but without this proper uh, feedback from the experiment. Now, Jan, about five years ago, uh, promised me <laughs> to do the experiment so carefully that he could measure the fluctuations, and that turned our attention back to the fluctuations. Now, what, what really is the problem? Look, in 1995, then again after 70 years of, of studies, this phenomenon of Bose-Einstein condensation has been finally achieved in the lab with the dilute gas. It was rubidium-87. And this is this famous first picture of a condensate that really made headlines even in the in the regular dailies. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's right. New York Times and, and others. Uh, okay, so this is the distribution of atoms, the Swedenborg atoms that are trapped in the harmonic trap at three different temperatures, the lowest and relatively high. 
in relative at relatively high temperature above the critical temperature we are dealing with just the regular gas term actually and the velocity distributions and of course density is also not uniform because of the harmonic uh, trapping potential at the at the lowest temperature here the peak is of course the condensate it is surrounded by a little bit of something that's the thermal gas what is really of the greatest interest to us is some how the situation in the middle where we have a condensate but we have also plenty of thermal atoms and in particular due to collisions some of the thermal atoms change the position enter the condensate or the, in the other direction leave the condensate and go to the thermal cloud so in other words there's some kind of a dynamic equilibrium which is which is really responsible for the fluctuations of the number of condensed atoms. I mentioned this out right that collisions are really needed to establish this sort of uh, equilibrium. And yet, most results are typically obtained for the ideal gas. And that is something that every school child should know when they learn about the uh, equations for the ideal gas, equation of state of the ideal gas, then of course it's very easy to derive it, assuming that there are no collisions. But on the other hand, without collisions, this phenomenon of, of uh, thermal equilibrium of the gas would never happen, right? So there is a little bit of contradiction and the contradiction is only a little bit if collisions play minor role for the final equilibrium state. But the approach to equilibrium is actually absolutely completely due to the collisions, either between the atoms or between atoms and the wall, right? Actually, only one of these things is sufficient. <clears throat> so the first thing that, that uh, you can consider you could consider how the amount or the fraction of atoms in the condensate changes with temperature and obviously as temperature grows the amount of condensed atoms decreases and then in the thermodynamic limit there is a well-defined temperature critical temperature where the condensate disappears however all the experiments are done with final finite samples and for finite samples this curve as well as all the other curves that I'm going to show you must be analytic and of course that leads to some correction for finite size like this red thing this red thing which is for 1000 atoms in a three-dimensional harmonic trap and as you see well there is some kind of a shift of the curve and smoothing and smoothing uh, in the thermodynamic limit and in the approach which is called grand canonical ensemble one easily derives the asymptotic formula for the depletion of a condensate and that is now part of the of the standard course in statistical mechanics all over the world however what is rarely mentioned are fluctuations are, is the variance of this number of condensed atoms and this variance happen happens to depend on the choice of the statistical ensemble in the microcanonical ensemble we are getting again for 1000 atoms atom this sort of curve for canonical this and for grand canonical absolutely absurd this absurd grand canonical result has been first noted by no one else but Erwin Schrödinger. So it's that requires really a great guy to notice this thing. And then later over the years, or better, over the decades, people started looking mostly at the canonical distribution, getting more and more information uh, about it. Microcanonical study is relatively 
recent. Uh, the reason is complexity. As we go from this most relaxed grand canonical ensemble that assumes change of heat and the change of number of, partic of particles with the reservoir to the canonical where number of particles is fixed, but there is temperature as a control parameter. In other words, there is some fluctuation of energy. Then finally, microcanonical would be this completely closed system that is not talking to the environment in terms of changing part uh, exchanging particles, but also in terms of exchanging the energy. Then these three results, as you see, are completely different. That is, this observation has been, as I say, difficulty with the, with the grand canonical was noticed by Schrodinger, but then the discussion of, of the canonical fluctuations uh, and clear statement that in, uh, that in the sense of these fluctuations, uh, this different statistical ensembles are really giving different predictions has been very clearly stated in the long paper by Katz, Ullenbeck, and Zink in the 80s. But of course, they were not interested in atoms trapped in the harmonic trap. They didn't know that once the experiment would be performed, then the harmonic traps will be distinguished. Of course, they were talking about the box. Fine. So now let us think a little bit about the statistics, and in particular about the microcanonical statistics. Just to uh, just to simplify uh, a few formulas that I'm going to write, I'm always shifting the uh, single particle energy of the ground state to zero, right? So for the harmonic oscillator, it might be by one half in barometer. Okay, so the ground state or the condensate state has for the ideal gas has the energy zero, which atom has the energy zero. Now, in microcanonical ensemble, the distribution of the number of atoms that are outside, that are uh, outside of the condensate, that are thermal, is given by this relatively simply innocently looking ratio. In the denominator, we've got just the uh, the uh, partition function of the microcanonical ensemble. And what is it? Well, it's just the dimensionality of the degenerate state defined by the total energy and by the total number of atoms. So we have well defined total energy, we have well defined number of atoms. This quantum mechanical state. Is of course non unique. There are, there are typically a lot of states in this, in this manifold. And just the number of the states counted that's the denominator. What's the numerator? It is something very similar. It is also a number of ways that the total energy E could be spread, but now among the Nx, some reduced number of particles, those that are outside of the condensate. So if you know the dimensionality of the space, number of states of Nx particles sharing the energy E, and we know the total number of states of the energy E and total number of particles N, then this ratio is of course probability of having uh, this number of excited atoms at that particular energy. Analog analogously, in the canonical ensemble, similar expression for P uh, is easily explained. I don't want to go deeper into this. Again, I have the partition function of a canonical distribution. Now, my control parameters are number of atoms and the temperature. And in the numerator, again, I have such a partition function, but for the subsystem, namely for those atoms away from the condensate, with a well-defined number of those atoms away and the same temperature. It happens so 
that this canonical partition function in some cases can be really computed. And this will be the only technical slide that I want to show. The reason I'm showing it is twofold. One, to show you how clever we are, <laughs> but much more important is that among young students here, there could be some that could benefit out of learning with this little trick that I'm going to present here in some completely different problem, be it astrophysics, be it general electricity, who knows? So the definition of the partition function, canonical partition function, I, I'm sure everyone knows. We've got this single particle energies E, and we have to sum the situation uh, with arbitrary any number of quanta of atoms placed at this given energy. The total energy in this Boltzmann factor is, of course, sum over population of a given level times the energy of that level, summed over all level. And we have to sum over all sort of occupations of each state. That would be very easy because that would be just the geometric series if we were in the grand canonical ensemble. But in the canonical ensemble, we've got the delta function the Kronecker delta function, which is really taking care of the total number of atoms, that is six. So there is a constraint on this sums yes, that comes from this delta. Now, if I see such a delta, then what comes to mind immediately is the Fourier uh, the, uh, representation of, of a delta. So I get integral over some auxiliary quantity psi from zero to two pi. And once this trick is used, then immediately I get truly nice geometric series. And this psi, of course, enters this, this, this coefficient. So the sums are given by the, again, high school formula. Okay, now next. Well, next is when you see integral uh, from zero to two pi, that what comes to mind is, of course, changing variables and going to the complex plane and introducing new variable z and, uh, and replacing uh, this integral by the contour integral over very simple unit circle. Right? That will be the one uh, the thing about is just parameterization of this, of this contour integral. Now, once we see such a contour integral over closed contours, then the Cauchy theorem comes to mind. And we see that there are simple poles here. So one has to simply use this Cauchy formula, and that's it. I will show you the result in a second, but immediately I, I, I make a remark. Of course, this is so simple if there is no degeneracy, if there are no higher order poles here. Uh, and if I take spherical, spheric symmetric uh, harmonic potential, then of course the energy levels are awfully degenerate, yes? This J's level is J plus one times J plus two over two degenerate. So in other words, if I would try to use this trick for the 3D harmonic potential, then I would be really in trouble because there would be poles that, that are thicker and thicker, so to say. But in 1D, that's not so bad. Or if I took a 3D problem, but with incommensurate frequencies, then there would be no, uh, no uh, degeneracy, right, in principle. OK, mm -hmm. so once this is done, here is the result, which with a mistake that Piotr Kulik has pointed to me, there should be K here, not J, but probably if I would not mention, you would not notice. So it's one dimension? Well, it is, I did not assume one dimensionality. What I assume is not the degeneracy of levels. <clears throat> and as I say, that could be in principle applied in 
whatever the, the dimensionality, provided there is no degeneracy. In other words, for instance, for harmonic oscillator, provided uh, frequencies are incommensurable. I can tell you that to use effectively this expression for such incommensurate situation is no good because there are many cases and in some sense hard to predict where they are, where the denominator is nearly zero and, and numerically this is very unstable calculation. So indeed 1D is really the area of reasonable applications of this formula. All right, so that was for for, for connoisseurs of calculations. The rest will be pictures mostly. All right. Oops. Sorry. I, I changed. I clicked in the wrong place. Oh, okay. So let's let's move forward. So as I say, there are for instance, one dimension. Why is not showing? What? Fine. It's fine. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But why is it now? Okay, disappear. Okay, so uh, back to one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. That's the result for one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. Actually, this problem is so simple that there are many other ways of of, of uh, getting this formula uh, right away. This formula for the atoms on the line, finite interval with infinite walls. That is just the direct application of, of the scheme that I was explaining a moment ago. But finally also atoms on a ring can be done this way. However, uh, the calculation is a little bit harder, namely on the ring, there is the there's twofold degeneracy. Yeah? Each state that corresponds to atoms moving this way is then degenerate with the state for atoms going this way, p and minus p. That is, but it's only twofold degeneracy, so a slightly better version of the Cauchy theorem can be used, and then the result is also analytic. But that's really all that can be truly done analytically to the point of getting actually formula uh, of much greater interest is of course excuse me one minute ask you yes what, this formula cannot be of, uh, derived further analytically in, in the thermodynamic limit are you working this in, oh i'm no? always working with finite system finite is that the problem sure yes uh well okay so in 3D, in the 3D harmonic graph, uh, people were looking at the thermodynamic limit of the distributions. And in particular, uh, David, Dave Politzer, David Politzer got explicitly a formula for the variance in the canonical distribution for the harmonic graph at n going to infinity limit, really at the thermodynamic limit. Here in Warsaw, or actually between here and Louvain Lanet in Belgium, with several colleagues, we have derived expression in the microcanonical ensemble. I was thinking of maybe going into derivation of this formula, but I thought it would be too boring for you. But for the rest of the talk, I want to stress that the ratio of micro to canonical to canonical for the spherical harmonic graph is actually very small. It's only 0 0.39. So microcanonical eventually very fast are truly. So your, your formula is also for in the uh, Of course, it's also for n going to infinity. That's right. No, once again, I want to stress 
that this is a very small number. All right, now for finite systems, people also work hard not to uh, derive the explicit formula, but to derive recurrence relations. And canonical recurrence relation has been obtained, I don't know by how many authors, but we are always quoting our good friends, Martin Wilkins and his former student, Christoph Weiss, uh, just because we learned uh, about this uh, recurrence uh, relation for canonical ensemble from their paper. And yes. when, when you compare canonical and uh, micro, micro canonical, do they have different parameters? Yeah, excellent. Very good point. I will energy uh, temperature. I will that's right. I will I will enter this very uh, subtle thing. Micro but I can also make a remark right now. In microcanonical ensemble, there is also a reasonable definition of microcanonical temperature yes. through the derivative of the right. entropy with respect to energy. So you, you compare temperature. Exactly. So there is a way. But you will see what, what are the other tiny difficulties uh, a little later. So as I say, this is uh, innocently looking again the uh, recurrence relation that allows one to compute partition function, canonical partition function for the ideal gas once if we know all the lower number partition functions. So in other words, this, this thing gets more and more and more complicated as we increase the number of atoms. Nevertheless, one can do it, one can use this formula to up to about 1 million atoms, which is really absolutely realistic. Experiments are done with hundred thousand or half a million atoms. So that, that, that's fine, that's fine. Now, microcanonical corresponding, I would say, recurrence relation has been found by my student, Zbyszek Idiasze, but that is much more difficult. Actually, that is, again, the N and energy are the parameters. Here, we were mixing we, to get Z, we had a simple, uh, single sum over lower number of atoms, right? Here, there is a double sum because also energy must be summed over. So this is like quadratic, so to say, difficult compared to the previous one. And actually, there are no delta functions, that's the recurrence relation. Oh. It's not the exact treatment with delta functions. Uh, all right, so as I say, this is really limited. Yes, but we have nice way of, of computing. Now, as I was telling at the very beginning, Jan Alt is measuring these days those uh, fluctuations, and he's measuring them not in the spherical harmonic graph, but with in elong somewhat elongated uh, harmonic graph with the aspect ratio, which is the ratio of frequencies transverse longitudinal ranging from not a great deal of change, but but the distribution here is. It's not on my screen. Ah. <laughs> okay, so in this range, there are these experimentally accessible lambda, these aspect ratios, but we always like to introduce also spherical thing, which is practically never uh, constructed in the, in the lab, but theoreticians love it, yes? So as you see, there is just a very, characteristic aspect or feature of all these curves, if one looks closely, then this is the, this rise is uh, proportional to the T to the Q. And then there is a rapid decrease of fluctuations just, be, just slightly below the critical temperature. As I say, uh, about four years ago, 
for the first time, Young measured the fluctuations, and the results are summarized in this picture. So, of course, these scattered points are the experimental results. The, of course, you see that error bars are huge, and a reasonable approximation to the typical curve as discussed a moment ago is this. So there was a nice PLL published together. All right. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about the effort and the efforts lasting really long time on including the collisions, effect of collisions. So far, I was always talking about ideal gas. And uh, one, there, there were several completely different attempts to include collisions. Ours was based on what we have developed here on so-called classical fields approximation. And the classical field approximation goes like this. We are replacing the atomic operator by the classical C number function. And instead of expansion of this field operator on some single particle base with annihilation and creation operators as coefficients, we do exactly the same, but coefficients are now classical complex amplitudes. As you probably can guess, and we learn very quickly, this is not good if we would not restrict summation, if you would not include some particular cutoff, if you would really try to do this replacement for all possible modes. And one way of seeing that this could be completely unreasonable, unreasonable is that in such a system, if you really go very, 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 very high, then almost certainly there are no atoms at all. Or in other words, probability of finding some atom is maybe 10 to minus 5. And instead of having this probability only, we are having real complex, complex amplitude alpha. And that is, of course, a bad scene. This is certainly not a classical state. It's nearly vacuum. All right. Now, once this substitution is done, then this Hamiltonian here turns into classical Hamiltonian of as many variables as there are as there are uh, modes retained, yes, in this finite sum. So the statistics becomes a real, I mean, sorry, classical statistics, and the partition function of the probability distribution of, of various alphas is given by the standard classical expression. Now, this expression is classical, but of course still impossible to solve, <laughs> at, at least in the presence of interaction. So what we are then, what we are then applying, we, we, we apply Monte Carlo type technique, uh, metropolis algorithm, to define a number, large number of copies of our system according to this distribution. And out of these copies, then we could, of course, compute various things like variances. However, all the results of interest depended very strongly on this cutoff here. So there was a fitting parameter that we had to deal with. And we had some educated guess what the cutoff should be. And this, so to say, justifications of the cutoff. Nevertheless, there is, there is an adjustable parameter in the theory. And that, of course, bothers us a lot. Now, finally, I come to the main part of the talk, which is our newest method of uh, also metropolis type, but free of this difficulty of, uh, of uh, ultraviolet catastrophe. And that is what we call a Fock states sampling method. I, yes, the previous slide, I n is uh, plain wave. So it would be plain wave if I was dealing with the uh, empty space or the cube with some periodic boundary condition. If I am doing things for the harmonic, that, that are of course 
uh, oscillator uh, functions. So, but but in principle, it could be any base. It, it only some one base could be more handy than others in terms of uh, calculation. <coughs> All right. So here I am now explaining my main uh, part. Now my states that form a stage, a form a space over which metropolis algorithm will, will be traveling are the Fock states. In other words, I assume that there is well-defined occupation at, of each orbital of a single particle orbital. And of course, all this is subject to constraint, namely some of these occupations must be equal to the number of atoms. And then my aim is to produce a lot of copies of my system, which would be spread all over the states according to this Boltzmann factor. In other words, my aim is again to compute the canonical distribution. And to really tell you how do we do it, I have to tell you what is this metropolis dynamics, how the system travels from one copy to another. Now it travels by, by shifting one atom from the initial state to some mode of the final state. For that, I need two probabilities. First probability is the proba uh, first probability is the probability of jumping out. That is simply proportional to the occupation of a given level, level. In other words, every atom has exactly the same chance of jumping. Now, what is the probability of arriving somewhere? It is also proportional to the already present occupation plus one. Why plus one? Well, because we have to give a chance of jumping to the empty state. Why n? Well, because we know of the Bose enhancement, or we know about the stimulated processes in electrodynamics, we know that stimulated process is proportional to the actually present number of quanta. And spontaneous, of course, is this additional one. So actually, this, especially this uh, formula, this prescription is, is truly, uh, I would say, coming from our well-established knowledge of processes with bosons, yes? That they like to stick together. Okay, we need acceptance uh, criterion. Uh, as, as always, this requires flipping a coin and finding number r between zero and one, and then comparing these Boltzmann factors for initial and final states, and depending on the on the uh, inequality, either accept or not accept the uh, the new copy of the problem of the system. All the assumptions needed for the proper metropolis metropolis dynamics are satisfied by this. Uh, uh, method of of defining the dynamics. So L R only only G R. <laughs> I flip the coin. I have a random number generator, mm -hmm. and I find R with the equal probability between zero and one. Mm -hmm. Actually, that is standard. Every time you think of using metropolis, you have to do it. All right. So now the same thing that I was showing before, but now we've especially marked these things here. So these little stars are actually results of our uh, Fox state sampling method. As you see, they are of course reproducing in an absolute, nearly perfect way the, the recurrence relations. So we are okay with the ideal gas uh, 
and canonical description. But moreover, methods that we have proposed allows us also to go to the to work with the microcanonical fluctuations. Why? Because if I have a thermal state defined the way I explain, then I can check what is the distribution of energies in this state. And of course, the energy is not fixed. It, it has fluctuations as always in thermal state. But now out of my full cloud of points, I can retain only those with the energy in narrower and narrower and narrower uh, interval in the limit, eventually getting fluctuations at the given particular given energy. Here comes again Victor's question, because if I'm doing this way, then I cannot use this machinery of entropy and proper definition of micro, uh, micro canonical temperature. What I am doing here, what we are doing here, we are attributing to the state obtained the temperature of a canonical ensemble that we, a canonical uh, temperature that we started from. It's of course not very well controlled error, but on little examples that we looked at it, it is really tiny, especially it's tiny for larger number of particles. So indeed here, we cannot use the trick with the entropy because we have no access to the partition function. No access whatsoever. Here are these results for narrower and narrower interval. As you see, the, for, for, again, for different uh, shapes of the trap aspect ratio, this is more elongated, this is, this is spherical. Uh, okay, and you see, there is a nice decrease. Of course, like microcanonical fluctuations are smaller, as I'm uh, repeating it over and over again. There is a little bit of a problem, or even a serious problem, close to zero, because if, if it would be really zero, then I would have no, no data to, to, uh, to, to do statistics. Well, but then, of course, the trick is to, so to say, stop before and then extrapolate the curve to zero. And that is very reasonable estimate of the microcanonical fluctuations. Mm -hmm. All right. So these are these S parameters, this micro to canonical at peak for various numbers of atoms uh, starting from 10 and ending at 100,000. All these points here are data from our method. As you see, to get this point, we had to compute microcanonical fluctuations for 100,000 atoms, something that has not been done before. Uh, there are uh, also solid lines here, and they are obtained using, uh, using the uh, recurrence relations. And as you see, they are, for very small number, they are not identical to ours. And the main reason for that is this uh, oversimplified way of attributing temperature to microcanonical fluctuations if we do our trick with the uh, Fox state sampling method. But, but, but this discrepancy is really decreasing as the number of atoms increases. On the other hand, we cannot go beyond 1,000 with these exact results because it's not possible to, do, to get results for microcanonical for larger number of atoms. Okay. Another thing is the role of, of uh, collisions and the role of collisions has been studied by many authors. And this is some kind of the, uh, some kind of the set of results put together on, on a single picture by Krzysztof actually. Uh, showing whether collisions, according to some authors, are increased compared to the ideal gas or decreased. And as you see, if, if people would vote, they would vote for decrease. On the other hand, we are sure they are increasing. All right, that's the next PRL 
uh, that has appeared uh, already some time ago. And that is the interesting aspect of this measurements from Denmark was that when they looked closer, they found out that their experimental results are really quite far from canonical ones, actually are much smaller, at least 20% smaller than canonical. And we convinced them that what they see is the effect manifestation of microcanonical fluctuations. We had to work a little bit on them because our theory would predict for the, their situation uh, even bigger effect of dropping, of decreasing the peak fluctuations compared to canonical. It's not clear what's the reason, what's the reason for, for a little bit of the discrepancy. Uh, I, will, I will return to it. Okay, so now, of course we wanted to see something uh, slightly more solid uh, concerning the role of collisions. And for that, we decided to make comparison of our predictions to those coming from what is called Bogolubov approximation. I don't want again to go into details and to try to be technical again, I won't. I just want to say that in the Bogolubov approximation, the atomic operator is replaced by the C number function that describes a condensate and, and the rest, which is of course, retains a character of the operator. And then the Hamiltonian, which originally is quartic in this delta, is then reduced by force, by approximation, to a quadratic form and a quadratic form can be diagonalized. So there are Bogolubov eigenvectors, Bogolubov uh, excitations, mm -hmm. and these are simply independent oscillators. So again, the uh, fluctuations can be easily computed, even analytically for, for simple geometry. However, this approximation is valid only for very low temperatures because, because this approximation is not satisfying a condition that the total number of atoms is here. There are new and new atoms produced if I raise the temperature and use Bogolubov. So only at very low temperatures and of course also for weak interaction, uh, Bogolubov approximation is valid. All right, so the, here is the comparison. Uh, I'm having this. May, may I ask you something? Yes. In, in one dimensional situation, there is no real condensate. So what, what is an F large? There is no body condensation. But, but if temperature goes to zero, everything arrives, arrives at the bottom of the cloud. So there is no critical temperature. Mm -hmm. But there is condensation. Mm -hmm. All right, so as you see, these are the canonical, which is again analytic for this case, and <laughs> micro canonical, which is obtained using our tricks results. And what is here is the Bogolubov ideal gas. As you see, as expected, Bogolubov works fine for very low temperatures and there is a nearly perfect agreement with our results. Now, suppose we are introducing, allowing atoms to collide, then a solid line is still the non-interacting thing. Now, the empty things are with the interaction. And then again, there is a Bogolubov formula, Bogolubov approach here, as you see, agreeing practically perfectly with our results. For this particular case, what is rather nice and what we stress over and over again as we discuss things with our colleagues in Denmark is that from the fact that for low temperatures interaction is in decreasing the fluctuations, one should not infer that the peak fluctuations are smaller. Actually, as this case shows, they could easily be bigger. We, we just stress it in this, uh, 
in this inset, uh, showing that while peak fluctuations increase, the fluctuations at very low temperature decrease, and it's perfectly possible. Mm -hmm. So what uh, early researchers were finding in this region, namely the decrease of fluctuations, and some others were blindly uh, assuming that that should be also uh, true at, at the peak is actually absolutely not true. Uh, oh, I want to say you something. Okay, this is similar thing done for the one dimensional harmonic graph. And here's the agreement. I don't want, I will not uh, uh, do, uh, say much about it, but here the agreement is, is reasonable, but it's not perfect. And the reason is, as we said, the reason is that, sorry, the reason is really of, uh, very interesting. Namely, in the uh, Fox state sampling method, we, are, we have non-interacting base of states. And that is fine if I'm dealing with the boxes of various dimensions with a periodic boundary condition. Because in this case, the condensate wave function is still a constant, even, even uh, for colliding atoms. On the other hand, if I'm in the harmonic trap, then this repulsive interactions in the, uh, as, as in rubidium are actually broadening the wave function of the condensate above the ground state Gaussian. And I'm using, I'm, at my disposal is only this base of, of, of non-interacting states. Therefore, there is additional error, so to say, introduced in our method if we use it for this sort of problems, for problems for which the uh, condensate wave function differs from the uh, ideal. Okay, so here is some kind of a summary of what I was telling you, but I still have something to tell. And that is about the shift of the critical temperature. People were working maybe even harder on the collisional shift of critical temperature than they were working on the uh, increase or decrease of peak fluctuations due, due to collision. And believe me, for decades, all sorts of results were obtained. Also in terms of what's the expansion parameter what is the combination of the constant of uh, the, the coupling constant and the number of atoms to which the shift of a critical temperature is proportional. At some point, most guys were obtaining scaling, which is proportionality to the number of particles to one third times G, this n to one third is easily understood because that is really controlling the distance between the atoms. And people call it now gas parameter. Now, once this maybe was established, there was still a question of the, of the coefficient here. And as you see, again, Ksushe compiled a lot of conflicting results for this coefficient. I like to stress that one of them is negative. All the others are positive. And the negative one is due to our good friend, Martin Wilkins, cool guy. <laughs> well, here is the formula for the relative shift of temperature. Temperatures for interacting gas minus temperatures for the ideal gas divided by temperatures for the ideal gas. It happens to be proportional to this combination of G and N. But the coefficient is to be, a, well, first of all, this, uh, the fact that this parameter is the right one, as I say, was disputed. But once this has been more or less established, then people were getting different proportionality. So the proportionality coefficient. Absolutely. Yes. And uh, as you see, you have a whole zoo of different numbers. Now, we can revisit this problem. All these things that I'm talking about are for the boss, because for decades people were only thinking about the boss. Yes? 
So we could again go to the cube, yes, and see what are our predictions concerning this shift. However, we realize again that, of course, notion, the notion, the very notion of critical temperature for finite system is ill defined. Yes? There, are, there could be different definitions, so to say, that could specify which temperature is the, so to say, uh, critical temperature for finite number of atoms, since there's always this analyticity uh, preserved, right? So then we said, okay, our full experience here is with the fluctuations. So if we look at the variance, or actually here the standard deviation, but doesn't matter, then we could look where does it go for the interacting case compared to the non-interacting case. Yes? This would be canonical, this would be microcanonical shift. The open things are, are, are with collisions. And this is unique, yes? the position temperature of the maximal fluctuations are really well defined. Uh, that has been noticed, not calculated, but noticed by us, Jacek and myself, already a long time ago. We pointed out in the short paper that has been completely uh, disregarded by others, that actually this is the unambiguous definition of some characteristic temperature and it's dependent on collisions. Now we are using this. Okay, so this, uh, this is an example. Here is something already combined. There are non-interacting results here, super imposed uh, the temperature and fluctuations are scaled in such a way that the maximum would be in the same place and at the same value. And the expansion of this region is here, plus there are these results for the, for the uh, collisions. And again, we are playing with the number of colliding atoms and playing with the uh, coupling constant, finding that just indeed correctly, our gas parameter is the right one and the coefficient is very close to two. It's very close to two, but probably with the error of 0.2. So it's between uh, 1.8 and 2.2. My last remark, really 30 seconds, is on situation where there is no critical temperature at all, and yet a shift of maximal fluctuations can be discussed. Mm -hmm. And that is the situation of a square. There could be many others, but of the square. So Piotr Kulik had this task of doing these calculations for the square. Here again, we have this relative shift of the characteristic, not critical temperature. And the result of this feed, which as you see is linear and really of very good quality, is kind of really surprising. We did not expect some crazy powers here. And yet they are, and yet the defeat is excellent, right? So I think we, that is the latest paper that has been submitted just. So it's too soon. Well, maybe. Yeah, it looks good. Maybe. But you know, we expected that it would be n to one half. Just because n to one half measures the distance between atoms on the plane, and it is not. I cannot help. Is it the result of classical fluid simulation? No, I no. My main results are all from box state computers, which are completely free of three parameters, convergent, and very good. <laughs> all right. So that's the and that's all I want to tell you. I can may I may I add one more small remark concerning publications. Of course, we are all urged or even forced to publish in open access journals. On the other hand, probably not only me, most of us don't want to pay for it. So with Shishek, we decided that Cypos physics is something to use. It has impact factor bigger than six, so it's twice as big as 
physical review A. And we convinced our Danish colleagues that that's a good idea of sending our written papers there. And there it still is. It has been accepted for publication early in December last year. We've got proofs around 10 or maybe 12. In two days, proofs went back. And then Maciej Krug, who, was, who is doing the submission, got a letter from them saying that the paper is now in line for publication. And it was two months ago. And the paper is still not out. Think twice about this is a uh, cycle. Okay, that's all. Thank you for the talk, especially on such a short notice. Uh, we are running out of time. We feel like for maximum one question. So thank you, one more. Between zero and one. <laughs> Sir, yes. How do you uh, control the number of collisions of this set? You can make more collisions, less collisions, or oh, of course, that is controlled by by parameter G, by the coupling constant. Oh, coupling. But all atoms collide. Right? Of course, everything. Mm -hmm. All of them have a chance to collide, but the uh, as I'm answering your question, G is the only. A parameter which is controlling how important collisions are. 